Is 90 minutes enough to tell a story that captures the entire human experience? What it's like having an identity crisis? How to embrace the change around you without letting it change you? Exploring how a child's imagination can be both beautiful and terrifying. Can a 90 minute movie really squeeze all that in? Yes. In fact, you can do it in 81 minutes. This is Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the first thing that came to my head was like, eh, it's shorter than 90 minutes, it's actually, actually. It's actually shorter than um, 90 minutes. Excuse me, it's actually... <laughs> It's kind of wild. I think you brought up off mic that even the 81 minutes thing is wrong. You were telling me what? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I was just saying like I paused it as soon as it cut to credits and it was an hour and 18 minutes. Wild. So a solid, what is that, 78 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? I like don't remember this movie being this short. Yeah, yeah. Same here, I think. As a kid, you don't really notice the difference. I watched this movie fucking religiously as a kid. All right. Well, I'm going to introduce the show. Welcome to Movies That Changed Us. I'm Altaf. And I'm Chris. And today we're going to talk about how Toy Story changed us. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or wherever you listen to our podcast, know that you can watch the show on YouTube at Movies That Changed Us. And we do have a Patreon as well at patreon.com slash nice dude movie night. If you're part of it, you would have seen this episode a day early. And we also have other goodies like commentary tracks every week. And, uh, you know, your name at the end of the videos, you know, it's, 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 it's fun time. Come take a look. And you get this podcast ad free. Yeah, 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 that too. Um, also, before we fully, fully get into it, I also just kind of, I kind of want to dedicate this episode to my parents because uh, it hasn't been an easy week for me recently. And, <laughs> and they've both kind of been there for me in a lot of ways. And this movie just kind of takes me back. Yeah. No, yeah, you did have kind of a rough week, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're doing well, though. You did have, like, you just had, like, I, this is my first time seeing you since you got COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to be back, you know, back in action. <laughs> yeah, like, so this was your Pixar movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was my movie movie. Not even just, like, as a kid, I just watched this on rotation on VHS. I still love this movie entirely. I adore this movie. It's probably one of the most, like, important movies for me personally in my development. And, <laughs> you know, my general love for movies. <laughs> it's probably, like, this uh, the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man, uh, <laughs> Lion King, I'm assuming. Sure. Yeah. Lion King, I, I came to appreciate more when I got older. Okay. 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 You know, but as a kid though, Toy Story was my shit. You know, I, I can go on about it, but I had a Woody doll and a Buzz Lightyear doll. I famously, at least according to- You had both the dolls. Fuck yeah, I had both the dolls and I wrote my names on their Did shoes. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, I wrote my name on their shoes. Oh, that's really awesome. <laughs> and, uh. My mom famously would make fun of me now because she says that when I was a kid and if I lost the doll, I would literally go around in public saying, I can't find my Woody. Where's my Woody? <laughs> <laughs> and my mom would be like, oh, God, all right. Let's... <laughs> that's very sweet. I, yeah. I think that that's a very underrated part about this movie is the fact that like, sure, it's you could look at it in a cynical way of just like, wow, they sold so much merch. But it is kind of cool that this movie's... Uh, called toy story it's about these toys but both woody and buzz are toys you would want to own yeah yeah 100 percent. and are just as special if you own them it's like very successful in that way i know i know that's the crazy thing yeah i you know toy story for me there's i don't even remember the first time i watched it yeah i don't know if this is the same, same for you but it just felt like it was always a part of my life mm -hmm. yeah same here i don't have a distinct memory of like Chris, this is Toy Story. You know, I probably just had it on when I was a toddler, maybe even younger. Because the movie came out in like, what, 93, 94? Uh, let me, wow. I think for the first time, I didn't like write that down. Um, <laughs> Bad alt oh, Unprepared. What is this, amateur hour? Uh, it, ac <laughs> it actually is. Let's just say, I don't know what year it came out. I don't remember. <laughs> Not, uh, 1995. Oh, it came out in 95. Okay, never mind then. Yeah. I mean, this was... Uh, I mean, people already know this. This is was revolutionary yeah. for computer animation. It was the first of its kind. And uh, a lot of people just didn't believe that they could do this. Uh, funny enough, person like Steve Jobs, who was a big part of the early uh, creation of Pixar, was a huge part of this movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just crazy, like, where technology was at this time and where filmmaking was at this time in terms of, like, how people looked at animated stories. Uh, the fact that this wasn't going to have song and dance in it either, like, the, it was all a big deal. Yeah. And at first, Tom Hanks, like, I think there was a, there's a story of Tom Hanks kind of unsure of whether or not he wants to do this movie because he looked at it as, like, a Disney movie. Like, I'm not singing. Like, he was, his, his thing is, like, I'm not going to sing. Isn't that funny that that was, like, expected at the time? 
And, and, and what do you mean? Like in this, if you're making an animated movie, you're expecting you're making another, you know, Little Mermaid or another Cinderella, like a or Disney something. Renaissance movie, exactly. Well, yeah, it, where they break out into song. And even though like uh, legends like Hayao Miyazaki were making like movies that weren't that, no. it just hadn't gotten to like the West yet. Um, obviously, people like John Lasseter and the team at Pixar are super influenced by Studio Ghibli and everything, and you can see it. But it just wasn't familiar in the West. And uh, it's funny that Tom Hanks said, like, I'm not going to sing, because in the second one, he does end up singing. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah. You watched the sequel recently. I did, yeah, and I'm planning on watching the third one soon, too. You were you had COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason we didn't have, like, we had, like, a delay in uploads and everything for this podcast is because you had COVID. And in your COVID watch, you were doing toys, you were watching Toy Story yeah. 2. <laughs> I know, I watched the second one just purely for fun, because I haven't seen it in a hot minute. And I would love to do another, like, an episode on just dedicated to the second one, because I do very much adore the second one as the, well. The second one definitely gets overshadowed by the influence and like the you know the impact that the first and third one had uh and i feel like people really forget about what like that that sequel yeah well, but it's so effective and you because you watched it i rewatched it again and i was like wow i know and it, the second one especially like deals with such mature themes you know and like, i think it's interesting i think this movie does but the second one builds upon it in a really great sequel way. It's a lot about, obviously, your purpose and identity in a way that this movie is about a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. And those are, you know, very deep things to explore for children. But I remember even like, you know, if we're still talking about the second one, I remember watching the second one as a kid and still able to understand what it was trying to tell me. You know, the idea of them being afraid of their time with Andy being temporary yeah. and knowing that, you know, but still wanting to stick with it till the end. Those are things that I remember being like five years old watching the movie and still keeping up with and knowing what it was trying like, to say. Like what's your legacy? What, yeah. uh, uh, what happens to you? Not like what happens to you when you die, but what, like how will people remember you? Yeah. And that's kind of subliminally what, su- subliminally, <laughs> subliminally what the second movie is trying to say. Yeah. And it's obviously switching it on like, uh, Woody instead of what Buzz went through in this movie. Uh, we'll talk about the second movie yeah. eventually. I think um, it's important to bring that up, though, because I, all these Toy Story movies, even the fourth one, which I think it should be said that you haven't seen the fourth one. Yeah, I still haven't seen it. For this franchise being one of your favorite franchises, you know, you haven't seen that one yet. If The fourth movie does the same thing where all these movies are about purpose and identity. And it starts with this one with like Buzz's whole arc and everything. And also Woody, the how he has to relearn the thing he says towards the beginning of the movie, which is like, it's not important how much we get played with. It's important that we're there for Andy, which is also just talking about like what your purpose is in life. Like, are we uh, like, how do we provide value to this world? Like, is it like what we, how we present of ourselves or is it who we truly are in, inside? Yeah. And, and the fact that it's not about what you get out of life, it's what you put into it, essentially. Because yeah. I think that's what, you know, Woody's fatal flaw is in the, you know, the first movie is that he's more about being in the spotlight and wanting the glory of being Andy's favorite toy and took that for granted, you know? Well, it's amazing, right? Because like in the beginning, like when, um, after the whole saloon sequence, uh, when it's uh, finally Woody gets up and he's like, okay, guys, uh, let's have a meeting and everything. And Woody, Woody says the things like, it's important just to be there for Andy. We Let's not stress about how much we get played with. And then Buzz comes in and it, like knocks Woody off his axis. Immediately. Yeah. Well, literally he gets knocked off the bed. Yeah. That's like <laughs> the first warning. Like as soon as they all burst in, they just fucking shock Woody and he gets stuck under the bed wedged in there. Yeah. And Mr. Potato Head is just egging him on. Like, I know. Well, that surprise is in your spot, Woody. <laughs> well, I love that Mr. Potato Head is such like he's always on Woody's ass, like always <laughs> confirms Woody's worst fears. But it works perfectly because it's voiced by Don Rickles, who is like a world renowned like roast comedian. Yeah. Iconic. And uh, he, like people call Jeff Ross the Don Rickles of our time. Sure. But um, Don Rickles funny until his death. Like he would show up like late in his age on Jimmy Kimmel and be like on it like so quick. Well, Don, I know you I know you have to I know you have to um to get uh, out of here. How, how, how long how long have you had that for crying out loud? <laughs> Go to a doctor. You're a star of a show. You're going to come out every night. 
Got to snap out of it for crying out loud. <laughs> and so it's so perfect that he's Mr. Potato Head. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's all he is. <laughs> and it's something I wanted to bring up is like with all these toys, they have such a distinct voice and identity and their performances feel so grounded. So it never feels like a gimmick. And that's because the actors that they get, they are people who are really, really good at their jobs at playing bit parts. Yeah, and I think as well, too. Like, and then you've got Tom Hanks and Tim Allen, obviously. Who are, but yeah, still. we'll get into but Tom Hanks and Tim Allen. But all the other side characters are people who are like, I'll name one. Is the actor who plays like uh, Ham. Ham is voiced by John Ratzenberger, who yeah. was in Cheers. He was like one of the main ensemble in Cheers. He was a sitcom actor. <laughs> and it just has that, like Wallace Shawn as Rex. It has these like small like character actors that are just perfect at hitting the notes. Yeah, and they none of them feel like they're acting in like a kid's movie. They're just performing like they're in a comedy. Ex- and I think that's exactly. what... Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's what makes it so strong is that like it doesn't... It's obviously, it's a funny children's movie about talking toys. So, of course, it's like naturally going to lend itself to children. But the comedy is very evergreen. You know what I mean? It's like very funny, this movie. Especially Mr. Potato Head. You know, we talk about, you and I like to say for listeners who are new around here, we like to say the stinker. We like to call certain people in movies stinkers. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. And I think Mr. Potato Head's the stinker of this movie oh, by yeah. far. I mean, I also think like, uh, I mean... Rec- Edge, as sketch is a little bit of a stinker he doesn't have many moments but i always love that moment when he's like draw and he draws the gun yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i know um i, I but yeah all um, like that whole opening sequence when you're meeting all the toys it's so efficient in how it shows you like what their purpose is and what their voice is um slinky is has to be like one of my favorites i feel like as an adult i've really appreciated slinky because something i value is just um in characters now in movies is people who are just loyal yeah and who yeah. really believe in something and i feel like slinky is that he believes in woody and has his like a good moral compass and like immediately when woody comes out he's like all right let's play checkers or whatever like yeah. he's such a good friend <laughs> um and then when he feels like woody lets him down it's so sad when he puts closes the blinds yeah yeah um and yeah yeah i think slinky's great I, I agree the same way I, I always like those little hints that you get of like what the toys do in their free time like they thought that through like the fact that he pulls out a checkers game they're in the middle of they have little habits of like playing draw with the extra sketch or when it cuts to um it was ham and mr potato head playing battleship yeah <laughs> and how they play wager he's like no not the year give me the nose <laughs> <laughs> Something that I was reminded of watching this movie, because I, okay, so to be clear in terms of like how much I love this movie, I love this movie. I grew up with it like you and you did. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I don't even remember the first time I watched it. Yeah. But when it comes to movies that like real Pixar movies that really hit me, like in terms of like right here in the heart of uh, and mo- I, what I remember seeing as a kid, like moments that really struck me, it was probably like Finding Nemo and Incredibles. Sure. Those yeah, were the yeah. two that really connected with me. And I just love Toy Story as a fun movie. But that being said, watching this movie now and seeing these characters show up, I'm like, oh, these are like my best friends that I haven't seen in a while. Like, because I don't rewatch this movie as much as you have. But like when I saw them again, I'm like, right. Yeah, (laughs) I know. man. (laughs) Suddenly I felt like I missed them and I love them so much. And I have this like connection with them. Yeah. Um yeah. that's like what's truly magical. Like within 10 minutes you love these guys, but then you and I also growing up with these movies and getting older with these movies, we feel like we really know them. That's the thing that I think makes the trilogy so special. I mean, I haven't seen the fourth one yet and I'm sure it does all that in flying colors as well. And now there's a fifth one coming out at the point of releasing this podcast, you know, so I'm l- let's see the fifth one. You know, okay, so just to explain why I haven't seen the fourth one real quick is because I just kind of died on the hill for a little bit that there didn't need to be a fourth one and I just didn't want to watch it because I thought the third one ended it ended it so perfectly and everyone tells me that the fourth one's great so I'm like fine I'll watch it and it deals <laughs> with like the same themes but in a, in a in a deeper way like the way a sequel should yeah um, like it had more to say yeah it just it, it the, like I think I don't want to say like it did it in a better way or a deeper way maybe I'm wrong there but it just had a reason to exist. Yeah, it justified itself. Yeah, and I think that's all I want in a sequel. And it just enough. needs to have a reason to exist. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you have... Okay, so just this is a basic-ass question, but do you, did you have any favorite toys growing up? Give me a couple. You know, okay, so I knew this was going to... I knew we were going to talk about this. Yeah. I didn't... And I, if I did, I'd have to ask, like, my parents. Do you remember, like, any? Can you give me, like, a rough handful? 
Um, it was probably just uh, like I remember I had a Transformers toy that I really liked. Okay. I had I had a lot of like uh, I I don't even remember, man. Like I didn't yeah. honestly like I didn't have a connection to toys. Interesting. So, like, when you were like, a when I was kid. a little kid, like, I I bet I played with toys. Like, my my dad told me, he's like, I remember I had bought you so many toys. I played with toys, but I didn't have like that thing that like Andy has, which is like, they were your friends. Woody's gonna sleep with me in my bed. For me, I mean, this is not comes as a surprise. Um, TV and just like TV was like a huge thing for me. Like, I watched so much tv yeah. like i in, did both you know <laughs> but that was kind of my vice it was like that was a thing for me as a kid i would just be in front of a screen all the time um and it was either that or just like my game boy or something like that. sure i was gonna say uh, video games were a huge part of my life growing up too but I, like i toys if i played with it it was at a young age where i don't even remember anymore that's crazy yeah i know because i to me i like even the way i bonded with friends was like what kind of toys they had too in a weird way like, you, I used to go to a friend's house and I'd bring some of my toys and it was, like, cool to combine forces, you know? <laughs> you know what I did have? I did have, like, I played with, I did Yu-Gi-Oh cards a lot. I had, like, mm. I traded cards with friends. I had, I was a big Yu-Gi-Oh kid. No, okay, I was, what about Pokemon? Pokemon, no. Yeah, same, same, I think, I think I had Pokemon cards in my house, but I, I went through a Yu-Gi-Oh phase. I think I had um, Kaiba's and Pegasus's evolution deck. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember what they entire. I remember Kaiba had the blue eyes white dragon. That was like the coolest fucking card ever as a kid. Uh, yeah. And but I don't remember it too well. Okay. You know? <laughs> I, I I did have like a like a whole Hot Wheels set that I like. I, I for some reason I like playing with like cars, and that's why I like Transformers too. Yeah. yeah. Like that that kind of stuff. Um. But yeah, I didn't have like that same connection. So I sure. I think um I think what I did kind of relate to. As a kid and also as an adult, is the opening of the movie. It, uh, this is fucking great. The clouds go, go into the saloon, and it's just a sequence of Andy playing with his toys. Yeah, and um, it I I connected to this kid feeling like he had to create this world in his room, you know, and just like that's how we played. It was just in his room this entire world, and I did that with other things. Like I used to draw a lot as a kid. I used to um, I was an only child. And I kind of escaped into my own world, whether it would be drawing or playing games or watching TV. So I did connect to that in a sense. Yeah. I do like that. Like, and yes, Andy has a sister and that's like in the sequels, that's more explored and everything too. But like um, in the first one, it is really just Andy. And so I, I, and like his relationship with his mom is kind of a similar relationship with I had with my mom. We were just me and her would like go out, you know? Um, so I did connect with Andy in that way a lot. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like, I had a combination of toys, but a lot of what I had as well were like props. Like I like to play imagination with myself a lot when I was a kid. Same. I used to like, I had like a little army helmet and like a squirt gun that I would pretend was an actual Same. gun and it, uh, toy lightsaber. And I would run around the house. Just like, just, I, <laughs> I know I legit had a squirt gun that I would pretend would be a real yeah, gun. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> like, I, uh, I grew, there was like a time in my life where I was like, like I didn't grow up in Maine, but I spent like five or six years in Maine. And I was like a, you know, probably close to Andy's age. Sure. And so in the place we lived in Maine, it like we had a classic like backyard where there was woods in the backyard. It was a, like a pond and everything. So like I would, yeah, I would play pretend take like, like was a Harry Potter nerd. Pretending yeah, yeah, to do yeah. that as a kid, <laughs> be out in the woods with my gun, with my squirt gun. Yeah. Like literally I did that. So, um, which is something that I do like about this movie. It just like it celebrates that kind of imagination. Exactly. I was just say even if you didn't have literal toys, you still understood the energy that it was putting out. Of course, the, that the way children escape into their imaginations, like you said, and the roles that you know. In this case, it uses toys as that, but also really just the toys are kind of just meant to be like imagination, like the way kids escape into that, and all of them kind of deal with that. Kind of like a little bit of a loss of innocence as the movie progresses. Yeah, and then Toy Story three three is directly that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, literally, I'm talking, even in the first one though. I would argue because like obviously Buzz deals with the reality that he's not even who he thinks he is. That like, he's just a toy. That's a loss of innocence, you know. And yeah. I think growing up as it's cool that they're able to explore that for kids to understand. Because like as children, I think as we get older, a piece by piece of our innocence gets lost a little bit. Yeah, I. Uh... You know, I I have a question for you when it comes to, like, since we're discussing, like, deeper things about this movie now. Sure. 
Is there a point, like, were you a certain age? Was there a certain time in your life where you felt like this movie clicked with you in a way it never had before? Um, it's hard to say. If, if I had to guess, it would probably be by the time the third one came out when I was like 14. Mm. Because I loved it as a kid and I watched the first two. I was like, like I said, I was obsessed with them. I had the, the fucking, I, you know, I think my older sister and I had the Sega video game. You know, growing up for the first one, and I had the PS1 game for the Toy Story 2 as a kid, you know? Right, right. All that stuff. I was fully hooked on it, but I think by the time the third one came out, and we'll get deeper into it if we ever do an episode on that one, but I think you and, you know, we all know the third one is a very much a tearjerker, and I think realizing, you know, kind of how much the Toy Story movies are meant to kind of play a role in your development at the same time. Yeah. And it yes. made me click, it made me rethink and reappreciate the first two as well. I mean, same for me. I uh, I think, like, so when Toy Story 3 came out, I watched it in theaters like everyone else in the world. Um, it was one of the biggest movies. Of course. It did re- make me reevaluate all the other movies. I'm like, oh, yeah, the first two were kind of dealt with similar things in a way that I never thought about. Yeah. Because you always think of the people always think of the third one as that really emotional one. But the first two are, like, just as hard hitting in different ways. And the third one is kind of building off of all of that. Yeah, I do think there's a lot of parenthood involved in it. I mean, even down to like just the facade that they put on, like as soon as Andy's done playing, then all the drama occurs that they don't want Andy to be part of, you know? (laughs) You know, I wanted to uh, talk to you about that. It is kind of amazing that the movie doesn't waste any time in world building or explaining anything to you. We accept as an audience member when Andy's here, the toys have to pretend they don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. And when Andy's gone, it's fine. They can be back to normal. None of that's ever explained. Yeah, but you just know it because you just see it happen. They just demonstrate it through what you see that they're like, Andy's coming. <laughs> it just collapse. You know, and you're like, okay, I guess they can't. They're just toys. You but know? <laughs> it's it's beautiful that there's, it's kind of underrated that there's no explanation Yeah, it's for so that. simple. The, the first movie is so simple, you know. I wrote would, that down in the notes. I'm like, there's like no world ending stakes it's like very simple, but also very human. Yeah, yeah. And then it's very, you know, I'm going to keep saying it, but it is a very mature thing for kids to process the idea that like you are not the main character, essentially. Yeah. And um, and even just the idea that most relationships, both friendships and parenthood, whatever you want to call it, is often based in selflessness, you know. That it's not all about you. It's not about what you get out of it or being celebrated as a hero or celebrated as this great person or great friend, whatever. You know, it's like that shit doesn't matter at the end of the day. You know what I mean? It's what you can do for other people. Yeah. And it's a nice and simple message, but both of them have to deal with that kind of coming to the realization that they're not as special as they thought they were. And that's okay, though. Like, like by accepting that you are even more special in a lot of other ways. Yeah. And then it even gets into just like, um, you know, hurt people, help people when it gets mm. to Sid's room. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you see the kind of like a whole separate community of toys that are all battered and rearranged. Where even... for a little bit it turns into like a John Carpenter movie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. The, the, the baby on the spider legs, I, I think it's pretty obvious to say. but it A lot of childhood traumas. Freaked me out as a kid. Really scared me. <laughs> um, I, I But, I, you know, I think like, I got to say... I love that Pixar did that. I love that Pixar wasn't afraid to scare kids for even if it was just for like 10 seconds. Yeah. That it wasn't afraid of that because I do. I don't want to be the old guy that's saying that uh, movies are too soft now. But I I sometimes do have this feeling that movies don't take that chance. Kids movies don't take that chance anymore to be like, it's okay for kids to be a little freaked out because if we show them that these people are not who they seem to be on the surface, but they actually are hurt, you know? And, yeah. and then then the then the kids through that story will learn something, but they need to feel that emotion of just, like, hesitancy because they'll f- be immersed with Woody's character. I think that that d- the dedication to that is kind of lost, and I think Pixar's still doing that with, like, Inside Out 2. Inside Out 2 is, has a moment in the third act that's, like, really rough. Yeah, but it's like I I'm like wow they're still taking that chance they're they're still going for it in that that's way. cool yeah yeah that is that is cool to know that because I still haven't seen Inside Out too I want to see it I'm hoping to see it soon it's on it's, I think it's a, on Disney Plus at this point it needs your money man it's not, it's not doing that well <laughs> I know Chris you're gonna be the one to save it yeah um I also just a shout out to that sequence too I also love the sound design of that sequence because all of those toys sound distinctly different than the other toys. 
like they put effort into that the way they all sound all creaky like when they walk out it's like like these weird noise like they all feel like poorly taking care of toys oh yeah i mean the craft in this movie is amazing yeah. because already doing this kind of computer animation was revolutionary like i said but then like you could tell everyone working on this movie were people who are like um, this is going to be sound pretentious, but we're students of cinema, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, the creative team at Pixar always talks about their influences uh, well, and Studio Ghibli is obviously a huge one, but actual like filmmakers are inspired by. Um, and you can see that in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, they use like, you know, really telling shots, you know. It, well, it, the obvious one is the Raiders one, the Raiders of the Lost Ark one with the magic eight ball. Or oh, no, no, yeah, the, yeah. the globe, the globe yeah, going yeah. after Buzz. Yeah, <laughs> he's running after it. But even in the beginning, just the small ways that you still use the language of film, because they didn't just want to be like, look at this pretty animation. It's really cool, right? Which, I mean, it is a really pretty looking movie. It still holds up very well, in my opinion. But I think they'd still do a lot of really effective, just basic filmmaking language techniques. You know, even in the beginning when... It's they're getting ready for the party. You know how you see Woody just laying on the chair for a bit and they just crash zoom or not crash, but they cut to a close up of Woody's face, like smiling. You don't hear him speak, speak, but you subconsciously know, oh, he's noticing something's funny going on. Well, yeah, the editing is very telling in that way. I, you know, the the scene that I always think about is like the bucket of soldiers, like dragging the walkie talkie down (laughs) and um, this uh, the scene where they're trying to get in the bush. It's like the way that's edited feels like an actual like Hitchcockian thriller. (laughs) Well, it's another sound design thing too the way that all the little soldiers like march but they still have that waddle and they're like gunk, 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 they, they, they i think from when i was a kid to an adult they still make me laugh <laughs> they're so fucking great yeah i mean like when you're talking about language of film also i think a shot that you talk about all the time with me is when buzz is revealed yeah that's probably it's one of my favorite shots in just movies why I don't know. Yeah, no reason. I don't know. It's just randomly picked. No, no. no. <laughs> I meant that actually kind of sincerely because I understand it's an amazing shot, but yeah. why does it like why does it stick out to you? It's honestly like unapologetic bias, like it's personal nostalgia, you know? I'm not gonna say it's superior to this and that or whatever. It's just for me, it just speaks to me and I'm okay with that, you know? It's the just for also for listeners, we haven't even said what shot it is. It's the shot, yeah, which is the shot when Buzz is revealed, when Woody comes up on the bed and the camera pulls back. And you see Buzz's feet and it moves up and you hear that music kicking in hard. <laughs> and you see Buzz's little shit-eating grin on his face. Yeah, no, I think uh, it, Buzz's introduction is like an amazing five minutes. Yeah. It's uh, cutting to the inside of his spacesuit, and you hear the breathing. Yeah. Uh, Along with the reflection from inside of the ooh. the helmet, you know, the way uh, Woody describes it. The helmet that does that, that whoosh thing. I know. <laughs> And uh, obviously falling with style. Oh, I mean, yeah. I remember, like, that. that is just so memorable to me, that entire sequence of him, like, getting on the bouncy ball, going up to that, like, whirly thing on the yeah. ceiling, <laughs> his face kind of stretching because of the wind, and then falling, he's like, Ken! Yeah, and then everyone's all, like, super stoked for him. Um, okay, I want to talk about Tim Miller and Tom Hanks. So, Tim Miller is so good in this type of role. Tim Allen, you mean? I, 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 you said it once earlier, and I was just kind of like, okay, I'll let Tim that Miller slide. Tim Miller is the director <laughs> of Deadpool and Terminator. I didn't want to disrupt lot. your train of thought because I, you know, I was listening and I knew what you were trying to say. No, and I'm, no, sure I'm glad you said it. I would have been. Pissed I just wanted to jump did. in when it was said again. I was like, oh, this is can't be an ongoing thing. <laughs> I would have been pissed in the edit if you didn't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> so Tim Allen, uh, he's so good in this type of role, right? Where yeah. it's just like kind of cocky, very sure of himself, but then gets like. Uh, broken down yeah. and it's basically his galaxy quest uh character in reverse yeah yeah that's he, interesting he's really good at just being an asshole without knowing about it <laughs> <laughs> i know i always love the nicknames that buzz gives to everyone when he's like all right lizard and stretchy dog <laughs> like how he just calls them casual names like that they're they both have their faults and moments of being kind of an asshole yeah. woody and but they're both extremely likable yeah. In different ways. Now, Tom Hanks as Woody. Tom Hanks is a person who's known as Hollywood's nice guy, uh, America's dad, whatever you want to call him, right? Underrated uh, f- guy to play someone who's extremely frustrated. 
Like Tom <laughs> Hanks, when he's at his best, is actually when he's at his most frustrated. Well, that's the thing. I know. Whenever we see like TikToks or anything of people doing celebrity impressions, whenever anyone does Tom Hanks, they're always doing the "Oh God, all right," you know, doing that they're, whole they're thing. They're doing Woody. Yeah, they're doing Woody, or you can argue um, League of Their Own, Tom Hanks. But but I, really, it's Woody. But even in the <laughs> Efron movies, like in Sleepless in Seattle, and You've Got Mail, like his, uh, like he's always great at just being like uh, tightly wound and yeah. strong, and he. He's talked about doing Woody and he's like, whenever I do Woody, it's always like kind of exhausting because my <laughs> arms are always clenched. I have to like kind of restrain my whole body because he's always so like, ah, oh, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the best example of that is that you are a toy. Yeah, of course, you're a child's play thing. <laughs> um, it's, it's. You're a sad, strange little man. Th- it's such a great, and they have such a great <laughs> chemistry with each other, like. Yeah, they recorded together, didn't they? I heard about that. Shut up! You just, you just, sh- you shut up! You, you idiot! Sheriff, Sheriff, this is no time to panic. No, this is the perfect time to panic! But I, I did hear that they recorded together for the timing and chemistry to feel more natural, too. I wouldn't doubt they did that in the sequels, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't know if they did in the first one, but they might have. You know, this is kind of random, but when you mentioned Toy Story 2, it reminds me. I forget that they planted the seed of Al's Toy Barn in the first movie. Yes, yes. Like, I didn't fully realize that, you know, which, I mean... We, you know, we, do you want to talk about that sequence when Buzz learns the truth, or do you want to hold that off for a little bit? Oh no, no, no. let's hold that off. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. I, I, I would like to talk about. We'll that We'll get a lot. to it. Just wanted to. Yeah, okay, cool. I just I get excited when I remember that scene. But yeah, their chemistry, Buzz and Woody, is so amazing. And now, like, you can watch the whole series and be like, oh, they're like the great friends, and it's like oh, they're yeah. my buddies, you know? Yeah, I, I didn't even like. I forget that it's Tom Hanks and Tim Allen. Like, just every time I watch it, no matter how jaded I get <laughs> as an adult, you know, and then, like, learning all the trivia behind it and, and stuff. And also how famous Tom Hanks and Tim Allen have become since this movie. And yeah. I mean, Tom Hanks, obviously, he's like our one of our great movie stars. Yeah. But like, still, when you watch uh, Toy Story, hearing their voices doesn't take you out of it. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of amazing. And also like Tim Allen is so fucking funny as he's Buzz. He's so good. Because like, obviously the first, you know, half hour. He's or, funny he's when he, because he doesn't know he's being funny. Yeah. And like, obviously, like he's still great when he's doing, you know, he's playing it super straight as a space commander and doing all of his stuff. But even like, you know, after he learns the truth about himself, when he's like pseudo drunk, when he's like, I miss Nesbitt. <laughs> it's like, ah, like doing all those little noises. He, he performs the shit out oh, of it. Oh, like my favorite is like, <laughs> I'm a sham. Yeah. It's like, is the apron too much? Just tell me the hat look good or whatever he was saying <laughs> it's so good <laughs> yeah no i uh i just think they're both great and i love them yeah yeah just shout out tom hanks and tim allen <laughs> which toy did you relate to to the most i mean both as a prob- kid and now as an adult i have more i guess in terms of like literal like you know that even the doll that i had i have more fond memories of woody i took the woody doll with me to more places so i think i'll always have that kind of special connection a little bit okay more so who do you feel like you are? <laughs> um, I feel more like Mr. Potato Head than anything sometimes. <laughs> if I had to pick one of them, right? Would you agree with Your that Your sense one? of humor definitely matches Mr. Potato Head's. Uh, you're not that much of an asshole as he is, but yeah. you do have like that kind of snarky sense of humor. Yeah, yeah I think, I guess I, I take from his like bluntness too a little bit. Yeah, like his sure. sense of humor is very harsh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, you know, I, I think... I, I think that I'm a mixture of the characters. I sure. can I can be Woody. I can be a Rex at times. Um, <laughs> I feel like I can be Slinky at times. Yeah. Or I think I aspire to be Slinky. You know, I look at Slinky the way people look at Samwise. <laughs> where I'm like, yeah, that's your... You want to be like Slinky. Yeah, yeah. Let's all be like Slinky. Um, we should make like a little, you know, inspirational shirt. It says, be more like Slinky. <laughs> that's pretty good. I should work for Pixar. Yeah, yeah, hire us. Um, <laughs> yeah, hire us as guys so, that were, that just say go around the office and say how good you are. <laughs> can, can you elaborate on it a little bit more though? Like, what? How do you connect with like Slinky or Rex or like like when you say you take a little bit of each of them? Like, what okay. part, what qualities do you like? From I them? I do feel like with Woody, I have this uh, feeling of wanting to be liked by everyone. Um, feeling at least when I was when I moved to LA, I felt like I had this like confidence of who i was and that changed a lot since then it's been like seven years since that time and um but like woody i changed a lot too through the through the years right but i was so confident of who i was and what i wanted to do and i still kind of am even though that's changed what i wanted to do was to be a part of movies in some ways Mm -hmm. and i still think i'm doing that but 
and not everyone has that gift but i also feel like i've had moments of jealousy i've had um and that's like kind of in me it's a part I fought for the spotlight a little bit a hundred percent and that's a part yeah. that i'm not the most proud of but i do have that in me i do get jealous very quickly um uh when it comes to rex just uh i'm i can be a big hypochondriac i am like i can go on like very anxious spirals like one thing can go wrong and immediately I'll think of 10 other situations of what could happen. Yeah. And yeah. I have to kind of calm myself down. Um, and with Slinky, I, I want to be a good friend. Yeah. Like I really try to be a good friend and I can fail sometimes. And, um, but I also expect the same from other people is yeah. that if I'm a good friend to you, that I want other people to be a good friend to me. And what I respect in friendship is honesty, loyalty, and someone who has a good moral compass. And yeah. I feel like Slinky appreciates that as well. Slinky looks for that as well. That's why he likes Woody so much, because he sees that in Woody. Yeah. And he uh, he's a good friend to Woody. So like I feel like those three I, are like a good, I guess, like triangle, a triumvirate <laughs> of what I want to be and what I am. Yeah, yeah. Because I think like it's funny because, you know, I... In terms of literal fond memories, like I said earlier, you know, as I do connect with Woody, but I think emotionally, like literally in terms of my personality and whatever, I think I have a little bit of buzz in me sometimes too. Like, so? almost, I think almost on the other side of Buzz's arc a little bit sometimes where like I get kind of ambitious sometimes about things. But and then like, w like once I come back down to earth a little, I, I realize there's nothing wrong with it. If that makes any sense. Okay, we can explore that a little bit. What like, do you mean Buzz by, like, is, ambitious? Like, so what like, are you talking about? I think I often have, like, you know, when I was younger, kind of like, I'm sure you can relate to this, too. Both of us have connected where we have these visions of ourselves and who we think we are a little bit. You know, I mean, you especially, you come, you know, like you said, when you came to L.A., I know you. I met you when you first came to L.A. I, you know, okay. you, you, you were like, we wanted to be a fucking hot shot. Let me you know tell what you, I mean? No, no, no. Let me tell you something. I think, like, within the first hour of our meeting, like, we went to in and out and I remember I told you, like, okay, so... I told Chris, I was like, okay, so you studied screenwriting. We should write something together. Yeah. And it was not out of like, oh, me and him bond really well because I barely knew you. It was more like, okay, I met another guy that's into filmmaking. Maybe if we work together, we could get something. <laughs> to Like I was immediately like thinking entrepreneur. You're networking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember like when I arrived at the, we lived in this like shared house with a bunch of other guys that were yeah. kind of, some were trying to pursue music, filmmaking, acting. Yeah, there are a lot of artists. It's LA. Yeah. My first night, and you were like at work or something, so I didn't meet you my first night but my first night i arrived and i like shook everyone's hand <laughs> like a fucking That's so great psycho i was like hi i'm all tough yeah i'm here for filmmaking and i was wearing like a fedora with, <laughs> and i had like a backpack and i was just like hi i'm all tough I forget about the fedora i yeah i had like a super embarrassing fedora phase hey you know it, dude you know it's cool that you know we could talk about it we can laugh at ourselves you know i was i was fresh out of a breakup at the time if and... i have the video here's Here's like a B-roll. I'm not going to share the clip with audio. There's no fucking way. <laughs> but uh, the, here's like B-roll of me like uh, going to the airport on my way to L.A. Because I, I recorded myself doing You're a gonna vlog. You're going to show that footage? Okay, cool. I'm not going to share the audio of it. It's just going to be B-roll. I know, Here but you're still going to have to extract and download that footage and like yeah, yeah. cut and paste it. <laughs> but, but something special. And it's like, so yeah, I do relate with what you're saying. That ambition, that feeling like, yeah. oh, I know who I am. And neither of us had that moment like fully just taken away from us like Buzz did. But I think that was something it that became a more slow process. For yeah, us. yeah, that's how that's more close to reality, and in, in, you know, in my opinion, you know, yeah, I know a movie has to do it in eighty minutes. Yeah, exactly. You know, but um, I think, you know, it's not like you and I realize we're less versions of ourselves. We're just different than how we thought we would turn out. You know what I mean? Well, and yeah, I think totally. we realize. Uh, for me personally, I'm like I'm more fulfilled than ever. You know, I love what I do. I love being someone on the internet. I don't. I honestly don't really have much of a drive to get into the real, in, you know, industry. You know that about me. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or both of us wanted to at one point. One of us were like, "Oh, we're going to be writers and filmmakers, or whatever." And I'm like, "Oh, this is great. I love doing this." Well, this <laughs> this channel started as a filmmaking channel. Yeah. We started this channel as a place where, like, okay, it's going to force us to make more short films and web series together. We're going to still upload every week, but we're going to do more like scripted projects. And yeah, everything. we wanted it to be kind of a jumping off point to break in a little bit. Yeah, and like, yeah, ambitions change, our goals change. Um, but like Woody says when he's in that crate and while Buzz is all down on his luck about how he can't help anyone, yeah. Woody says he's like, no, I've, being a toy is so much better than being Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. 
You see, there's a kid in there that loves you and wants to play with you. And it's like kind of realizing your value outside of your ambition. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. You want to talk about the scene now? Because I feel like we're just like circling around. Dancing around around it a little bit. Okay, so, uh, you know, Buzz and Woody are stuck in Sid's house. Oh, man. I feel like before we get into the... I, I also want to talk <laughs> about the crane pizza planet and the crane and all that. Okay. I don't know what I'm going to say about the crane besides the fact that like it is they, they're my minions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. They're a better version of minions <laughs> than they're mine. I, I wish boomers would, <laughs> would share memes with the fucking aliens from Toy Story and not minions. You must let him go. He's been chosen. <laughs> <laughs> he must go. <laughs> <laughs> they're still funny. They're still so funny. Um, anyways. Um, Woody, uh, Woody and Buzz are stuck in Sid's house where all the toys are being experimented on and they're trying to find a way out and Buzzy com- Buzz comes across a commercial of Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, because they run, they're split up by the dog. They try to run out and they both were forced into separate rooms and then, yeah. um, I believe like it's implied like the dad is sleeping. On yeah, you chair. see like, uh, uh, what seems to be the shape of a dad yeah. with his like legs on a lazy boy. Yeah. Um. Who fell asleep in the dark. Yeah, it also establishes, like, in a very clever way what Sid's home life is like. Yeah, 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 exactly. I know. Comparing it to Andy's home life, whose mom's always present and wants to go to Pizza Planet with him. Buzz sees the commercial of Buzz Lightyear, a classic toy commercial. They show, yeah, they show Buzz Lightyear, like, in B-roll flying, and then they crash. When it's like, you can buy Buzz Lightyear today, it crash zooms on text and says, not a flying toy. Like, yeah. in fine print. And the- so it's literally telling Buzz, like, you cannot fly. The shot that stood out to me as, like, an adult watching it now is that it cuts to this wide with Buzz centered right in front of the TV and him looking down. And I'm like, what the fuck is, did this shot come from? It I just know. feels so cinematic. And if you feel like the weight of his world is and changed. And you see how small he is, too. Yeah. yeah. Like, when you're talking about, like, how this movie uses film language so cleverly, I mean, like, that's the scene. It's like, you feel like this is the 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 world has changed for him. Mm-hmm. And then um, the scene that made, still makes me tear up is Buzz trying to fly. Yeah, when he walks out and then even like right before he jumps, I see the bird flying across. More filmmaking shit. You know what I mean? So beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's so well done. Um, and yeah, he's climbing and you can just see like his, his drive that he still doesn't want to give up. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't want to believe what he just saw. Because they, they, a lesser movie could have easily just had him just be like, oh, well, that sucks. I can't fly. But he still goes out there and tries. You know what I mean? And still fails. Yeah. And not only that, because obviously there's the famous scene where he jumps in slow motion, he looks like he's flying, and then you see his face drop as he realizes he's falling. Yeah. But when he lands, how his arm comes off too. Like, it just adds to that humiliation that, like, he is a hunk of plastic and that his, like, he's not even flesh and bone. Like, his arm came off and nothing happened, you know? <laughs> you know, I think I, I want to tell a story. I, 2021, before lockdown, I was working a restaurant job while still trying to do like Nice Dude, mm-hmm. where we were back in the eight days when we were trying to be a filmmaking channel. Yeah. When Nice Dude, it was when it was Nice Dude Productions and not Movie Night, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and lockdown hit. Obviously, people know the story. We couldn't do short films, so we started doing reactions, and that's how we became a reaction channel. But there was a moment where I wasn't proud of the fact that we were doing reaction channels. And at the same time, I was trying to, uh, because a nice dude wasn't making money yet, I was trying to look for a job that wasn't in the restaurant business. I was trying to look for an actual editor job. And I was fi- getting a lot of, like, no's, a lot of rejections, like you do, especially in 2021, being stuck at home. That was really getting to me. And at one point, I, like, took a walk to the park. And I, like, thought to myself, I arrived here in 2017. It is now 2021. And I remember being in that park being bummed out that I'd spent four years not uh, doing what I set out to do, which is be a filmmaker. And even though I had done it, but not in the way I had envisioned, and I couldn't even get a job as an editor, which I looked at as this like, how, oh, oh my God, I'm so, in, you know. And I cried. I was at, at the park and I was just crying to myself because I was like, well, I don't think you ever told me about this. And I, I figured I felt like I had to leave. I was like, well, I should just leave L.A. Why am I even here? I'm spending so much money staying here. I can't even uh, get close to doing the thing I love. And walked back home. And this is when you and I not only lived together, but literally shared a room. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were pretty broke. We were, we were buddy-buddy roommates, you know? Yeah. And I remember telling you, I was like, should I just leave, man? And I got like really, I was like getting really emotional. 
And I think you told me, you're like, just keep, keep applying. Being an editor is not this lowly job that you think it is. It is something that you are good at and just keep going at it. Yeah, it's something you're good at. And I also think you enjoyed it more than you let on to that. I think that was the core thing for me. I remember when you talked about it, it was like, I think you like editing, but you just don't think you do. I remember I kept saying like, well, I don't want to just be an editor. I just, I don't want to just be an editor. Even when we were doing it with a nice dude and yeah. we were making short films and I was the editor, I was like, I don't want to just do this, by the way. I'm also a director. I'm like, I don't want to, hopefully we get an editor soon. Yeah. Whatever. I was so like up in arms about it because I had this idea of who I wanted to be an idea, this idea of who I was. And when that shifted, there was this moment of, again, buzz in front of the TV. This problem what that I think is huge that is changing my entire worldview. Who am I? Yeah. And I don't want to be cheesy but and corny because this seems like the corniest thing that I'm about to say. But in that moment, I felt like you were my Woody where like you told me. You're like, dude, like you like living in L.A. You like editing. It's not like you didn't. This isn't this city is not just about your ambition. The city is about you. You like you enjoy your time here and I don't want you to leave. I li- like I like being friends with you and I like doing this with you. And we're still going to be doing Dice Dude. It's that's not gone. And um it's uh, you know, it's it, that was like the moment that I had that Buzz has in the middle of the movie where it just feels it feels so seismic and big. Yeah. But sometimes you need someone to show you a little perspective and show you that, like, yeah, man, those ambitions weren't who you were. That it, there was something deep. It's the, your value isn't just your ambition. Um. So yeah. So yeah. yeah. It's 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 interesting, like watching this movie and how much you can relate to it still. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a very very core level. I remember that moment too, pretty vividly. You know, <laughs> and um. Yeah, I don't, I don't. It's hard for me to know what to say because it's. I feel like that kind of thing just belongs to you, and I want to let you speak your piece about it, you know. And I don't want to just be like, "Yeah, you were wrong in that time," you know, whatever. But like, I remember that was like a big thing we talked about for sure in terms of like feeling comfortable pursuing being on the internet for a living and and finding that happiness. Now I think you and I are just we, we never turn back, right? No, and also understanding like I remember like a uh, a friend of mine told me very recently. That because I was kind of getting upset about like, oh, man, um, it feels like, uh, you know, the reaction channel isn't doing as well as I had hoped. And this is not a complaining. And I appreciate all the people that show up to our channel. We're doing fine. Mm -hmm. But every now and then you have these like this worry that you're not as big as you want to be, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to my friend about that. And my friend told me something that I remember. She was like, you know, some people aren't even lucky enough to find something that they love doing. Yeah. And you found that. So if it works out, if it doesn't, it, like at least you tried and at least you found a passion. And I didn't realize that. I didn't realize how lucky I am to since I was in like high school, know exactly what I want to do and now being in LA and doing it. Like when I was in high school was when I first started my a YouTube channel. It's all, those are all private videos, guys. You can't find them. Um, <laughs> uh, but that was when I started a YouTube channel. I uploaded weekly. I did like a talk show of like that, uh, talking about the news. I wanted to be like Philip DeFranco. Yeah. And I did that in high school and I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to make videos. And then when I was in college, it turned into filmmaking. But I always wanted to make su- stuff. And now, all these years later, I'm making videos on the internet with a friend of mine that shares the same passion. And it's insane that I met you because I spent half my life across the country. And I (laughs) met someone who shares a similar passion as me. That is so lucky to have that. It is pretty crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It is pretty nuts. Dude, it's insane that we met each other. (laughs) It's a miracle, isn't it? Because I I think I remember that when I guess when we were first talking about that, I knew that from you. You know, just for your own sake, because even even if it's not whatever, even if, you know, you find your happiness not in nice dude or in other things, I just knew like you just had to follow what made you happy. You just That's all I wanted from you as a friend. And, you know, because I think you were kind of following this kind of this roadmap because you think it's almost like a curriculum, like you should have been there or something like that, even if you didn't really want to be. But you just kind of, you know, you well, weren't really touching base with what you really wanted out of life. You know, you know, what I also think is interesting. I want to know what you think of this, too. I feel like we're we're at this like 
uh, we're at this cross point of certain things where there was a time, obviously, when uh, people go to go to a work, it was a nine to five, and then you have your home life. It's all like compartmentalized and you go to work. That's your work, your job. You're not really supposed to like it, but that's your job. What are you going to do? No. And yeah, maybe some people did what they loved, but that wasn't it wasn't like a common thing of everyone just gets chase your passion. Right. Yeah. And then there was a phase of like, you know, when obviously the internet was blowing up and when YouTube was starting to become a thing. And then there were some people on the internet that were making it a career just to make videos, right? Early YouTube. I'm talking about Grace Helbig, Shay Carl, Philip DeFranco, people like that. And then it became this thing of like, you could actually, the weird thing that you used to do, which is make videos on your own, you could make that your job and you could have fun doing your job. And it was exciting. It was cool. And High school Altoff saw that and he was like, I'd, I'd love to do that. Yeah. And now it's at a point where like the your the maybe the the compartmentalization of your job and your life was actually a good thing. Because now it feels like what I struggle with a lot is that when it comes to the uh topic of identity, is your identity gets melded with your job where you don't even know who you are anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think what you said about just like even if you don't find happiness in nice dude or whatever i know who you are and you like you need to do what makes you happy and it's hard to figure that out when you're who you are is also with match with your job so hard mm -hmm. you know and i think for buzz that's what he's like going through in this movie is just that like no but i'm buzz Lightyear, part of star command that's who I am. I'm a hero. But if I'm not that, then how am I of use to anyone? And then Woody has to remind him. He's like, buddy, you're a toy. Andy loves you. And like, he's like, you're a cool toy, too. And you're a cool toy. I, you know, you're maybe a little too cool. I wish I was you. And then you, yeah. you get perspective. And then the fact that, like, Buzz realizes that he can still be of help. Yeah. Yeah. And I think going back to what you said just real quick, because I relate to what you said in terms yes. of, like, yeah your identity blending with it, especially when like, you know, for you, people like you and I, it's like, we're not like the world's biggest YouTubers by any means, but we do have a following. And I think people follow us for literally you and me, our friendship. And we have to make sure in a weird fucked up way to keep our friendship alive, because that's what our channel is, you know, essentially it's like we, if we weren't friends, we, and our videos would suck. Even if we still did videos together, our chemistry would not be the same. Yeah. And it's a weird thing where it's like, how do you prioritize like, okay, well, we need to be friends, not just for videos, but we need to be friends because you and I like each other. We just like being around each other. Well, there's two things you're saying. One is you're saying we need to be friends because that's the reason people watched us. Yeah. We also need to be friends for us. Yeah. You know, but how do we separate those two and how do we make sure we can like. You can uh, distinguish it. Distinguish it too. Yeah. Exactly. Can I ask one question? This is kind of a shift of topics, you know? And okay. you might not have an answer based on what you've told me earlier. Sure. So I know you didn't have many toys growing up. You remember? No, no, no. I had toys. I just don't remember. Well, you don't have... remember your toys growing up. It's yeah. a better way to say it. Yeah, you have yeah, faded yeah. memories. Do you have any, like, okay, let's say it, Toy Story was real and there were toys that came to life and we weren't looking. Do you have any fucked up story with toys that would make you feel guilty <laughs> if you learned that toys were alive? I, all used, I mean, I definitely used to just like... um uh, throw toys in terms of just like uh, when I was having I do I have memories of like having toys fight each other having action figures fight each other or whatever and then throwing one against the wall <laughs> or even trying to be like I wonder if I can customize like I've done the whole thing where I've like tried to take off a leg of one and put the one other like <laughs> I'm seeing if I can do stuff with yeah. it like a Lego set so like I feel like that's kind of the thing I think about. And I don't have like again, I don't have a specific memory, but I did do I did like fuck with my toys in a Sid like way. Sometimes. Sure, sure. Fair enough, fair enough. I did was just you? curious. I you know, I have one story that I didn't do personally, but I remember. Yeah. I used to have this stretchy like rubber toy. You know, you know, like those kind of weird little I don't know what you call it, those really soft, kind of oh. fleshy feeling toys that you stretch out and can do things with. Yes, yes, yes. I yes, had yes. one that was Spider Man. It was all red. It had no shades or nuances to the colors, but it had like kind of etched in like Spider-Man's webbing and it was all red and you could stretch it out and stuff. My grandpa's dog ate it. Okay. Cause it's like a soft little thing. Sometime later, 
Shit my it. grandpa gave me the toy back. <gasps> Whoa! <laughs> and my mom freaked the fuck out. <laughs> Tina was so disgusted. Did you ask questions? Did you ask questions? I was like 10. So I knew what it was, but I wasn't as grossed out as I, sh- as I should have been. <laughs> but... I love that your grandpa's like, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Don't ask how I did this. <laughs> My mom again freaked out. Didn't want me playing with it. Didn't oh want my me, like, god! You're gonna get bacteria. <laughs> what have you done to my son? <laughs> like, but point is though, putting myself in the shoes of if toys came to life, imagine that toy <laughs> just being like, "Oh, guys, I'm back." <laughs> um, God, isn't it so satisfying when Woody's like so plain nice? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. As soon as they traumatize Sid, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, Sid will never be the same again. I like, know. Sid I know. is actually gonna be <laughs> fucked up, like for life. <laughs> <laughs> or it's going to be like a um, repressed memory. That's probably more more close to yeah. reality. But I, I know I love how like they all slowly come out of the water and are like, Mama. <laughs> like it's so scary. <laughs> you know something that's uh, I think kind of underrated about these movies is how they use the toys. So um, yeah, yeah. Like I, I sometimes I think about it. Like okay, this is an animated movie, so they can't shoot this. They have to think of every little detail. So the idea of okay matching up the two toys to go through the vents. And adding the fishpole one to make him like go down and go into the doorbell or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Have, oh, the duck has to swing into it to push the doorbell. To think about that entire set piece, you have to have like an idea of how action set pieces and suspense works. And like those are things that I don't see in like uh, animated movies that Pixar does so well is that it makes you feel like you're actually watching a De Palma movie when you're <laughs> watching these stuff. I think, yeah, I think at the core of it is it. this is a movie that feels like it can only be told about toys like they use it like all the set pieces are built specifically around the fact that they're toys like my my favorite is like when buzz is like when there's doing this montage of everyone working out and it shows like buzz running on that little yeah exactly the the little yeah the little robot flipped upside down as like a treadmill i mean yeah yeah, and even like how they when they're on uh RC, which is already creative right off the bat. They take the RC and are just hand controlling the controller to, to drive him. And then on top of that, how they use Slinky and stretch him out all the way oh, across to God. try to pull him in. The, it's really cool. Like it's constantly creative with the use of toys. So you want to talk about the action sequence, the final third act action sequence? I mean, yeah, of course I do. So I think this might be my top five and I don't have the other four, but it has to be in my top five like chase scenes. Yeah, so because it, it moves so smoothly, like right when they traumatize Sid, scare him away. Immediately, the stakes just rise right when they see that um, the moving, moving truck. Yeah, the moving truck's driving away. So they're like, oh shit, we got to go. It immediately adds a ticking time bomb. There, it, you understand the geography so well. Like their goals are so well established. And it does the thing that I love in any good action set piece or chase sequence where every time they get close, it's like one step forward, two steps back. Like they get they get onto the car and Woody's stuck between the fence. And yeah. or no, sorry, Buzz is stuck between the fence. Because he can't Wo- fit because of the rocket that's blocking the space. And Woody has to go back and get him. It shows his growth as a character. Exactly. It's it's testing their friendship. I, I, I still to this day, man, I'm watching it last night and I know what's gonna happen and I'm constantly frustrated. Yeah, it's it's still just as exciting and tension filled. Well, it also it like adds extra stress because the dog's chasing them early on too oh yeah my favorite is like when the cars like finally like crash and they surround the dog there's this like final shot of the car like the dog being defeated yeah yeah. when he's like surrounded by all the crash cars he was the last big boss yeah (laughs) but they're able to light the rocket through the reflection of the sun and he's like you're flying no i'm falling yeah we're falling with style it's just it's so joyous yeah i know that it still gets me kind of emotional like as soon as they're in the air and you see woody's arms sprawled out like flying with buzz you know even just like the idea of like they're both flying together it's not about one showing off or the other they're in how they pass over the moving truck. He's like, wait, the moving truck's there. And he's like, we're not aiming for the truck. My favorite line. It's just like, dude, we're top dogs. Here. Yeah, yeah. Like they we're go- top build. We're not going to be in the truck. I know, none you of and them- I, I'm, I'm Tim Allen. You're Tom Hanks. We're not going to be in the fucking truck with Wallace Shawn. <laughs> They're in the back. They're in the bouncy truck. But, uh, but also, like, you know, I also love how Andy and and his mom don't even question it. They literally just yeets right into the box. That's my favorite part. It, it, <laughs> like, it always, it stays through, like, the series of just, like, even in the third one. It's just like, 
I lost um, Woody and Buzz are not in the box, and then they just magically show up. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's course. so oblivious all the time. Well, it. it's also reality. I mean, we lose our toys, and then they just sort of appear all the time. Yeah. That happens where you think you, you're like, you're at the world's ending. I lost my favorite toy or this video game disc or anything like that. Then you're like, oh, wait, it's been under the couch. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I forget how quickly it wraps things up after that. So they have that kind of final look at each other. Yeah, they wink at each other or whatever. Yeah, and it cuts to, like, Christmas time, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the army man's hiding in the Christmas tree behind, like, a little ornament. And Woody yeah. shows up all delirious with kisses marks <laughs> on his forehead. And Buzz is looking at him as, like, kind of like a proud friend. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, all right, man. <laughs> but there's also this feeling like they're both sharing the bed, which I love, that they're both sitting on the bed listening to the walkie-talkie. It's, like, a great visual representation. We finally get Mrs. Potato Head. We don't yeah, see yeah. her. I always, I thought we see her at the end, but we don't. Yeah, not until the second movie. I do love that Miss Potato Head stays, and then yeah. she's like a part of the series. I know. I'm packing your angry eyes just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Extra pair of shoes. They do. <laughs> Mrs. Potato Head's so great. Yeah. I always, I forget that she's not in this movie. Yeah, I know. I know she's amazing. But yeah, and also like they, I like how they touch on Buzz getting nervous too he's like are you nervous yeah, and he's like no 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 but it, it like it's a nice little touch that he's integrating with the community now with the family mm-hmm. you know he's he's now part of the, the experience of being a toy and then you know what he's like don't worry buzz what, you know what could andy get that could possibly be and worse it, than you and then it pulls away kind of like it's a wonderful lifestyle yeah. you know but then it just crash zooms when they realize it's a puppy yeah and then they hear like uh oh <laughs> it kind of ends that way yeah <laughs> all right do you want to wrap it up how yeah. did this movie change you you know, I didn't really, I forgot about that question at this point, but I mean, it's kind of what we already talked about. I think it's just the reality that, you know, friendships are based around selflessness more than selfishness. Yeah. It's very obvious, but it is harder in practice than it is, you know, in just saying it, you know what I mean? And um, that the reality is that like, you're going to, you your responsibility is to bring other people up and not bring people down to you, you know? Yeah. And it's okay to share that. Sharing the spotlight, like you, I think you said that in your notes. Totally. Um, this movie changed me because it changed me like as I got older, because it helped me realize and it helped me, it validated my feelings of I'm more than my goals, my career goals, my ambitions, um, kind of the stuff that like Buzz goes through. Even though I said I relate to a lot to Woody, Rex, and Slinky, maybe I relate to Buzz a lot more than I think I do. People love me for me, not for my ambitions 100 percent. yeah and it's like this thing that woody says to you is like uh, woody says to buzz that i keep on quoting is like there's a kid in there that loves you so much yeah um and it's the thing you have to remind yourself is just that like okay maybe there's certain things that you wanted in life that you didn't get people still love you there are people that think you're awesome and you just gotta like you gotta make sure you surround yourself with enough people that remind you of that so Thank you guys so much. God, I'm about to cry. Uh, <laughs> Let's get out of here. <laughs> like my voice actually shook. Holy shit. All right. So thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much to our patrons for supporting us again and again. We really appreciate it. Last but not least, stay nice, dudes. Booyah. Nice. We brought Booyah back.